Welcome. Thank you for joining us today at Messiah Online. It's great to have you with us. We'd like to ask you to please register your attendance with us. Just check on the uh, icon there on your screen and let us know that you're, you're here today. We have a few announcements before we move into our time of worship. Uh, first of all, our Thin Spaces group, which is a women's book study group, is hosting a pumpkin decorating event for anybody in the congregation. It's going to be on Sunday, October 20th at 1145 here at the church, and you can get signed up online for that. It's $15 a person, and it includes lunch. We also have coming up on this Sunday at 11.30 um, in the morning in my office up in the Life Center a Camino uh, de Santiago information meeting. And we're going to be taking a trip uh, to walk the Camino. It's going to be about a 70-mile walk. The trip is from June 18th to the 30th. All are invited to, to come and find out more about that. We'll also have a, another meeting, if you can't make it on the 13th, which will be Tuesday, October 29th at 7 p.m. in my office in the Life Center. Pastor Jay is going to be starting an exciting new Bible study on the Sermon on the Mount. It begins on the 23rd of October, and there's going to be two different times you could attend. Three o'clock in the afternoon on site, or you can uh, uh, attend at 7 p.m. on site, but you could also attend with the Zoom option at the 7 p.m. Um, Bible study. And you can get signed up for that online also. And we have one of our big community outreach events coming up. It's great fun. It's our trunk or treat. It's going to be Friday, October 25th. We're still looking for some more trunks. So if you would like to participate, have a whole lot of fun with uh, people of all ages from the community, uh, get signed up for that. And if you want more information, you can also uh, give us a call in the church office. Pastor Jay's not with us today. He's on vacation visiting two of his daughters in New York, and he's going to be back with us next week. Now let us begin our worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never failed me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
Please join with me now in a word of prayer. Gracious God, open our heart to your Holy Spirit and help us understand just how precious we are to you, how loved we are by you. Open the eyes of our souls to see the gifts you've put before us this day, gifts of forgiveness and redemption. Give us the the grace to recognize each encounter we have with you. Teach us to respond with gratitude and to grow in gratitude. Teach us to be generous as you are generous with us and to collaborate with you and serving our sisters and brothers no matter who they are. Lord, thank you for the love that, you, that accepts us and gives us purpose and, 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 and significance. Thank you for your truth that provides us guidance and direction. Thank you for your mercy that brings us help and comfort. Thank you for your faithfulness that produces courage within us. Thank you for the beauty revealed through all of creation and for the joy and delight it brings to us. And most of all, thank you, Lord, for your way of redemption, the cross, for it brings us forgiveness and transformation. And all God's children say, amen.
Our scripture lessons for the day come first from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And then echoing that similar theme is Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's the good news for this morning. Well, today we're starting a brand new sermon series. Remember who you are and whose you are. Now, for those of you who've been around Messiah for a while, you've heard that mantra of mine many times. You may not know why that's so woven into the fabric of my being. Well, in every family, there are important rituals and sayings that become part of our family narratives. And to be honest with you, I don't actually remember how this began in our family. I do remember years ago hearing Pastor Dan Storvik say these words one day. And Dan was the senior pastor here at Messiah when I came on staff 39 years ago. We worked together for two years before he moved to Prescott, Arizona. And at some point, while our son was still young, probably before our daughter Tess was born, I started saying to him before he went to bed, before he went to play with a friend or go stay at his grandparents' house, remember who you are and whose you are. I suppose I was saying that to him before he could even comprehend the depths of what it meant. Ty is now 39 years old and Tess is 36. And to this day, I still remind them at times to never forget who they are and whose they are. It's become a grounding statement in our family. And in those words, it carries multiple meanings. It means you're special, you're loved, you're cherished, and you're part of this family, this clan, this tribe, the Moonies and the Winstons. It reminded them that, that they're, they're courageous and kind and compassionate and created for good in the image of a very good and loving God. And they're part of this community, this sacred and holy tribe we call the body of Christ. And that they are unconditionally loved, cherished, and chosen. There's a wonderful account of a little boy who suffered with a very severe case of cerebral palsy. And when he was still a very little boy, some of the people entrusted him to him to take care of him, took advantage of him. And instead, they did things to him that made him think that he was a very bad little boy. Because only a bad little boy would have to live with the things he had to live with. And in fact, as the boy grew up to be a teenager, he would get so mad at himself that he would hit himself. He'd hit himself hard with his own fist. And he would tell his mother on the computer that he used for a mouth that he didn't want to live anymore. For he was sure that God didn't like what was inside him any more than he did. Now, the boy had always loved Mr. Rogers. And and he watched his show whenever it was on. And the boy's mother sometimes thought that Mr. Rogers was keeping her son alive. And one one day, she found out that Mr. Rogers was actually coming over to meet her son. But the boy was made very nervous by the thought that Mr. Rogers was coming to visit him. He was so nervous, in fact, that when Mr. Rogers did visit, he got mad at himself and began hating himself and hitting himself, and his mother had to take him away into the other room. Remember, the boy is now in another room, and he's hitting himself. Mr. Rogers didn't leave. He wanted something from the boy. And Mr. Rogers never leaves when he wants something from somebody. So Mr. Rogers just waited patiently. And when the boy came back into the room, Mr. Rogers talked to him. And then he made this request. He said, I'd like you to do something for me. Would you do something for me? And on his computer, the boy answered, yes, of course. He would do anything for Mr. Rogers. So then Mr. Rogers said, I would like you to pray for me. Will you pray for me? And the boy was thunderstruck because nobody had ever asked him for something like that ever. Although at first he didn't know if he could do it. He said he'd try. And ever since then he keeps Mr. Rogers in his prayers and and doesn't talk about wanting to die anymore because he figures Mr. Rogers is close to God and if Mr. Rogers likes him, that must mean God likes him too. Well, the journalist who was interviewing Mr. Rogers about this account and 
complimented Mr. Rogers on being so smart. What a great psychological move. The boy has been prayed for, always been the object of prayer, but by asking the boy for prayer, you made the boy feel better about himself. Mr. Rogers looked puzzled and then shocked by the journalist's remark. He said, oh, no, I didn't ask him for his prayers for him. I asked for me. I asked him because I think that anyone who's gone through the challenges like he has, that they must be very close to God. And I asked him because I wanted his intercession. Let me suggest that Mr. Rogers was able to look at the profound brokenness of this boy's life and see that it was not a wasted life. That it was and can still be a life of meaning. Mr. Rogers could see in this broken boy, beyond the disability, beyond the hurt, beyond the anger, to who he really was and whose he truly was. At the deepest level of awareness, it's not possible from a worldly perspective or a religious and, and moral one, but only through the cross of Christ that we can see who we are and whose we are in that same way. For the cross shows God's intention of turning ashes into beauty, of rebuilding ancient ruins, as it says in Scripture. That instead of shame, we will receive a double portion of love. That there is nothing so broken that God cannot restore with God's love. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, what we heard just a few moments ago, we're reminded of the incredible truth of who we are and whose we are. We are loved. And in God's sight, we are worth redeeming from the brokenness and the darkness that so often permeates our circumstances, our lives, and our world. We're reminded of who we belong to, not as property, but as cherished members of God's very own family, as God's own unconditionally loved child. That is profound and a life-changing proclamation that we must let sink deep into our hearts and souls. That redemption and forgiveness are what could give our weary hearts and souls peace and hope and joy and light. Are there broken people in your life? People where you look at them and you say, whoa, I better stay away or I'll get cut. Are we broken do we have situations that have caused us to maybe give up hope because life's too painful or unfair? Maybe you wonder, why has God called me to such a terrible place? Is God trying to sabotage me? I want you to seriously reflect on this, on, on those situations and circumstances in your lives or the lives of others that throw you for a loop, that make you doubt if you're loved or cherished. Ask God to give you the spiritual eyes to see and to trust in God's unrelenting, fierce, and unconditional love for you. And if you're looking at a person who is broken, if you're suffering and, and you see the suffering of another, maybe God's Spirit is, is prompting you to love these broken people, to persist in your prayers for them, and to love them back to life. In light of the truth that God is good all the time and that when God created us, God looked at each one of us and said, oh, this one, this one is good. And then he said, no, no, this one is very good. That's what God says when he looks at us. And the problem we face is that we also know that we're not perfect, that we miss the mark so often. We also know and often believe that we're so flawed and we're so broken at times that at worst we're unlovable. And perhaps, at best, in order to be loved, we think that we have to work really hard at being more perfect. And in essence, both of those scenarios point to the fact that we can and often do forget who we are and whose we are. We begin to live and act in ways that are contrary to who God sees us as and created us to be. We think that life is rooted in either proving that we are somehow better people more likable, more successful, more talented, more personable, or more intelligent than others. And we think our value is somehow tethered to how high we can climb up a ladder. We think we have to outperform everyone else. 
Or maybe we just think that we're just so unworthy that no one, not even God, could love us. Have you ever been in such a place? I tell you, it's not a good place to be. We will never experience peace from a place of performance or from trying to prove ourselves. It's easy to conclude that people, including ourselves, are in some of the messes we find ourselves in because of the wrong or bad choices we've made. And sometimes we think maybe we deserve the mess that we find ourselves in. Yes, it's true that in some cases we live under the consequences of our choices. But would any of us seriously say to the boy with cerebral palsy that he deserves his suffering and pain? Many parts of life and the world do exist under the realm of darkness that we had no control over. And darkness, like a hostile force, has real power to act in our lives. So where and how could we ever find joy and peace and hope that the human heart longs for? Rabbi Albert Lewis tells the story of a man seeking employment on a farm. And he hands a letter of recommendation to his new employer that reads simply, he sleeps in a storm. The farmer is uncertain what to make of the note, but desperate for help, he hires the fellow. Several weeks pass, and suddenly in the middle of the night, a powerful storm rips through the valley. Awakened by the swirling rain and the howling wind, the farmer leaps out of bed. He calls for his new hired hand, but the man is sleeping soundly and doesn't wake up. And so the farmer dashes off to the barn where he sees to his amazement that all the animals are secure with plenty of feed. And then he runs to the field, only to discover that the bales of wheat have been bound and wrapped in tarps. And when he runs to the silo, he finds latched doors and dry grain. Only then does he understand the note. He sleeps in a storm. The rabbi concludes, if we tend to the things that are important in life, If we are right with those we love and behave in line with our faith, our lives will not be cursed with the aching throb of unfulfilled business. Our words will always be sincere. Our embraces will be tight. We'll never wallow in the agony of I could have, I should have, and we can sleep in the storm. Another way to say this is that when we live firmly grounded in the realization of who we are and whose we are, then we understand our purpose. We live with the ability to sleep in a storm because we know that how we live our life is based not our own merit, but is based on the unconditional love of the God who created us. We live being reminded every day of who we are and whose we are. We've witnessed the past few weeks the impacts of storms in places like Florida and North Carolina. The destruction is both graphic and it's undeniable. The destruction and hurt are real. Storms that have turned people's worlds upside down and inside out. And yet, we all know that storms don't just race through our physical world, but even more so, we've all faced raging storms that mess with our mental and our emotional worlds too. None of us, not one of us, is immune from the messy, the tragic, the inconvenient, and and the unfortunate experiences of life. And sometimes the the storms of our life strike so suddenly. And some of the storms rage into our lives as the consequences of our own selfishness and arrogance. And other storms, like in the story of the little boy with cerebral palsy, rush into our lives by no fault of our own. Now this story is not just a story about a storm. It's not even about our ability to sleep. It's about our ability to be at peace. This I know. In the midst of a storm, we survive by remembering who we are. What I know to be true is that every day we have to fend off the voices that try to convince us in one way or another that I'm a nobody, that I don't have a right to be here, that I'm not enough, or when, or when I arrive at such and such a point, I will find happiness, or I'll really start to live when all the storms pass. But none of those are true. It's a way of thinking that tries to convince us that our identity is found somewhere outside of us. The voices telling us this are often very loud. And yet sometimes the voices are nothing more than a subtle whisper to our soul 
telling us that we're insufficient. I heard on the news the other day someone suggesting the government was creating and controlling these terrible hurricanes and steering them towards areas that were politically unfavorable to their candidate. Now, I'm not a meteorologist, but I do know that we do not have the power to control the storms. I also know that sometimes storms figuratively and literally turn our world upside down. So what do we have control over? We can, conserve, we can secure the bales and latch the silos. What is the one thing I can do in the face of storms in my world? Well, each of us can choose. Choose to refocus on the truth that our value, our sufficiency, our wholeness are already there, already a part of us. Even if we don't see it because the storms are raging around us and sometimes raging within us, God's love for me and you doesn't depend on how we feel or what we're going through. It solely depends on God's goodness. God's love is revealed beautifully in the 23rd Psalm when it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because God is with me. You are with me, God. Remembering that God is with us always is affirming that we are the loved and cherished child of the one who will never leave us. And to remember that is to remember who you are and whose you are. Amen. And now let's join together in confessing our faith in the God who loves and cherishes us. And may this creed remind you once again of who you are and whose you are. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now please enjoy this video. So uh, my husband and I found Messiah approximately 21 years ago. Um, we felt at home right away. It was a warm family atmosphere. And uh, what we liked best about it was you, Bob, the stories that you tell, how you personalize everything and, and make everyone feel comfortable. And so that's why we began our journey with Messiah here in Yorba Linda. So I've been involved in um, the youth group, making sure they had rides to uh, Bible study. Um, involved in confirmation, uh, being a guide and um, helping with the kids and their learning, um, to simple things like providing food and um, taking uh, the giving tree uh, tags off and contributing. Um, I've really had a good time at Messiah. Yeah, um, my older sister Ashley and I we were involved from a young age. So we did some of the plays. And we did some singing, which hopefully you can't find, because it's not very good. Um, we both had our first coming, first coming on Messiah. And also did confirmation there. And we still go. Ashley actually started the college ministry on Messiah. So yeah, we've been there since I was five to now 26. So in December of 2021, um, for those of you that don't know, Alexis had a major car accident. Um, she almost died. There was an angel nurse on uh, the freeway in the mess that was able to find two people to pry her out of the car and they breathed into her mouth until paramedics got there. 
So this has been a long journey and Messiah has been a huge part of this journey. This has been a, obviously a difficult time for our family, but Messiah has supported us emotionally, um, spiritually, um, in every way you can imagine. I mean, the outpouring of letters and um, the good wishes and the people that approach us. Uh, she's be become somewhat of a celebrity in the community yes, because so is. many people are a part of Messiah. Um, they've offered up services for us as far as uh, providing um, the sanctuary so we could have a fundraiser for Alexis and pay for some of her medical bills and stuff. I mean, um, Pastor Bob was there from the very beginning, you know, within hours of the accident. Um, I don't know what we would do without Messiah. You guys have really done a fantastic job at uh, wrapping your arms around us. Yeah, I've received a lot of messages online. People giving their support. And in the hospital, I probably received hundreds of cards, letters of support. And even to this day, some people still write to me. Because of Messiah, her story had gone around the world. I mean, people in New York have contacted us. She got flowers from Africa. Um, literally around the world, people have contacted and wanted to hear her story and hear how she's doing. Um, she's definitely here because of God. And, and people realize that and they just want to be a part of it. And it's very heartwarming. A couple of months ago, I saw a new speech therapist and at the end she goes, I think I know you. <laughs> Do you know Bob Marion? <laughs> like, yeah. I was, I was stunned that Messiah was going to donate a well on behalf of Alexis. Um, it was so touching and to think how important that well is. I mean, I've been a part of, you know, giving money toward the wells over the years. And um, just, just to know that those people are gonna see her name on a plaque and just to have them pray, that's really been the most important thing to me as a mother is having people pray for her, mm -hmm. pray for her continued um, growth and um, well-being and um, health and just to know that people are, are thinking of her in that way and praying for her, that just, that made my day. It's hard to even put it into words. It felt really surreal because to me it's like, well, I'm just doing what I have to do. But to see that I get inspired to so many people, it was shocking. And we feel those prayers. I mean, we, we see her progress and we, and we know the Messiah is behind it and that God's behind it. And it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, and, and you have helped in a way where you have guided us through a tragedy as well that has a positive side to it. It's spreading God's word. So I, I don't know that we would have seen that on our own. You know, thinking back on her journey, there was a time that we couldn't get the mental health that we needed for her. She was stuck in ICU. It was a breakout of COVID. Um, it was a desperate time. She wasn't where she is now mentally. And Messiah came through again for us. There was um, a counselor, a psychologist in our um, in our family here with Messiah, in, in our congregation, who came out with her husband and spoke to Alexis. And, and that, was, that was huge because she was not feeling good about herself, not feeling good with what had happened. And, and they came out and supported her. So that's another way that Messiah has been there for us. And there have been members of the congregation who have maybe had similar experiences we were able to reach out and give advice. Yeah, give advice to me yeah. about what to do, 
where to go, who to talk to. Um, because when you go through something like this, there's a lot of mental anxiety and stress. Another thing comes to mind, and that is, um, in the early days, it was really dark. Um, we didn't know whether she was going to live or not. Um, we didn't know if she lived, what her life would be like. And so um, Messiah was there for us by um, sending people that had gone through similar situations, spinal cord injuries, accidents, uh, coming to talk to us, not only pray with us, but talk to us about what reality is like and giving us advice about how to work through the system. And um, because when you go through something like this, you're just, you're mad. You're mad at everyone. You're mad at God. You're mad at everyone. And you just, you, you don't know where to turn. And they taught us where to turn. They taught us what to do. And I want to thank my parents for being there for me along the way. And Pastor Mom and all of us, Zion. I couldn't. Mm. You couldn't get through it without them. Yeah, I know. I feel the same way. I mean, um, it's a family um, that supported us. And um, like I said, I don't know what I would have done without Messiah and Pastor Bob. Um, it's because I think of our church and our community and Pastor Bob that we have been so successful and um, gotten to a point in our lives where we can live again. Yeah. I'd like to thank Kathy and Alexis for um, sharing their story and their journey. And this is a great reminder for us as to why we give. We give both out of our gratitude to God for all that God has done for us and for all that God has given us. And we also give so that we can together as a church continue to be fierce and compassionate and the loving hands of God to others. Whether they're partners in our ministry here or whether they live in our community or across the seas, we, begin, we give because of who we are and whose we are and the desire to make this world a more loving world and in order to continue ushering in the loving kingdom of God right here on earth as it is in heaven. So we thank you. We thank you for your gifts to Messiah. And when you share your offerings with Messiah, it's so that we get to continue to participate in this mission and this vision of God to not only love God, but to love others. And so we're encouraging you, as we do each year about this time, to make a commitment for the coming year so that together we can continue to not only worship, but we can continue to dent the world with love and compassion within our congregation, our community, and world. You can use the, um, the commitment forms that are online, um, and there are also a variety of ways for you to make your offerings to Messiah. You can go on our website. You can uh, click the Give Now icon. You can use automated giving through your bank. You can text to the number on the screen. You can mail your offerings in or drop them off at the church office. However you choose to give, thank you for supporting us and continuing with us to bring our mission to fruition of loving God and loving one another. And now please join with me in a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, you hold our lives in your hands. You've redeemed us and forgiven us, and you remind us over and over of who we are and whose we are. We are loved, and we are your cherished children. You've promised to give us a new heart and to put a new spirit in us. Renew us every day. Forgive us where we fail to be good stewards and to be good neighbors, and give us courage to think beyond our own lives to live and consume responsibly so that our near and far neighbors can experience their full dignity and that we can help restore and admire the beauty of communities and of this earth. Our God, you hold our world in your hands. You hear your creation groaning, but you've promised to liberate it from its pain. We pray for the people affected by the storms, Helene and Milton, 
for all who have lost homes, possessions, and loved ones. May they not lose hope. Give them peace, and through the love and hands of first responders and the generosity of people across our nation and world, may they find hope and rebuild their lives. Lord Jesus, you said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. You are the God of mercy and compassion, the God of grace and reconciliation. Pour your power upon all the children in the Middle East, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Palestinians, and Israelis. We join our prayers to those of the people of Ukraine who look to the heavens for peace and protection during this time of violence and oppression. And we ask your mercy that it may change the hearts and minds of those who've chosen the path of destruction. Lord, we know that war can bring about only suffering and death. We look to you, God of peace, to bring about reconciliation between the people of Ukraine and Russia, between the, the people of Israel in Palestine. And together with them, we pray for the peace of the whole world, for every city and land, and for our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger. And Lord, let hatred be turned into love, fear to trust, despair to hope, oppression to freedom, occupation to liberation, that violent encounters may be replaced by loving embraces, and peace and justice could be experienced by all. Give us and our leaders the courage to think beyond our own economies, to seek genuine partnerships so that all people can experience the fullness of life, and that our planet is known to be the common home for all creation and future generations. Renew our spirits and cleanse our hearts. Renew our minds, transform our lives. Renew our cities and rebuild our ruins. Renew our world, and in your name we pray. And all God's children say, Amen. And now let us join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you once again for joining us today at Messiah Online. It was great to have you with us. And now, to you and to all whom you love, receive the benediction. May God go before you to show you the way, above you to watch over you, beneath you to support you, beside you to be your best friend, and within you to be with peace, love, and containable joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve our Lord with joy. Thanks be to God. <laughs>